Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Well, I'm famous for my totally unsophisticated slides, so they're just, just black and white, for which I apologize, but it gives me the opportunity normally to change them very, very quickly, even during the conference, uh, which I didn't do today. Even though what, what um, Lee has just explained, I found that extremely inspiring. I will, um, I will take a much easier look at smart contracts and also at blockchain and I won't even be capable of using the terminology you were just introducing to us, which I think is a very interesting, very interesting t terminology, but I first would need to digest all this. So where's the mouse? So. I would like to start with, I would like to start with something really easy, something, um, what we are actually talking about. So this conference is still called blockchain, right? But we all know that, well, blockchain, we are not really sure that what the financial industry is doing is actually blockchain. So for me, the most fundamental categorization is what, what we are talking about is the following. I uh, divide this in first, second, and then the following generations. The first generation is actually uh, what we know <coughs> as Bitcoin. Is um, represented by Bitcoin. This is the original idea of the state remote distributed network that has an immutable ledger um, and that is run by individuals and therefore something quite apart from uh, structures that uh, we, we use normally. Then the second generation um, uh, networks is still the same than the first one with one additional feature, and I see Ethereum maybe as the most important representative of that, of that generation. It can store a different kind of data. It can notably run smart contracts on this privately, uh, privately run and state remote, uh, unchangeable, immutable network. And then what is happening right now is the creation of other generations of or other types of blockchain or DLT networks and these actually take from the former model or from the Bitcoin model these the characteristics that they seem useful that they deem useful and they may add on other characteristics which they also like but it is more like a, it's more like a, like a cherry picking process. You take what you like and you don't take what you don't like, and that allows you to build something that you can actually use. The interesting thing is, I think it is still most efficient to start the whole discussion or the analysis from the point of view of the original blockchain uh, model, like Bitcoin. And that is what I did in my paper that I wrote in December, which only came out a couple of days ago, unfortunately. Um, I, I, I looked at the very fundamental characteristics of the Bitcoin blockchain. How does that actually work? What are these characteristics? And to keep it simple, I try to um, limit these characteristics to three fundamental ones. So the first one is the distributed nature of the ledger. Um, that has a couple of consequences, positive and negative ones. Yeah. For example, a positive uh, consequence is the resilience yeah, against um, events that might bring down a central server otherwise and then with it, with it the, the entire system. But it has also other consequences, like for example, disintermediation. You can see this as a good thing or you can see this as a bad thing. When you want to save cost, disintermediation is something uh, really interesting. But when you are in the business of intermediating, you maybe don't like the idea at all. Then it does away with a concept that we are so used to that I don't think anybody today has actually mentioned it. That's the account. In uh, nowadays, in, in today's financial markets, everything is based on accounts, cash accounts, securities accounts, and so on. An account is much more than a technical process of um, accounting for something. An account is, an re is, a re is a relationship, a legal relationship, a private law relationship to which important public or regulatory um, thoughts are attached. 
And in the distributed ledger environment where everybody is connected to everybody, we don't have accounts anymore. And then let, lastly, I have already mentioned it, these systems are, because of the distributed, uh, ledger, uh, distributed uh, nature, they could be literally everywhere, including the people that manage them. I have bought a couple of background slides which, which, I will spare, uh, which I will rarely use to make that very clear what we are talking about here. So this is a centralized and this is decentralized and decentralized networks. I have borrowed these models from a paper from, uh, from Professor Barron from the early 60s. Uh, and that is the one we are talking about. So the, you don't have accounts anymore. You have accounts here in this, in this uh, context. So what I'm talking about is just this, yeah, <coughs> the real blockchain network. I'm not talking about this, yeah, because this is a blockchain network underlying yeah, with little intermediaries like Bitcoin exchanges, for example, or wallets or whatever you call them. And they, again, they have client relationships. But that is like intermediation, and we have said that at the very beginning of our conference. So I'm not talking about this here. I'm just talking about this. Just to make that very clear. So, the next characteristic uh, of blockchain network networks, in particular those that come out of the of the idea of Ethereum, that's the increased data depth. So you might be able to store on such a network, on such a record, record data which is much more dense, which, which is much more, much richer than the data we are currently storing in accounts. I always imagine it like when you have a securities account, you store the information, you have a security or you don't have the security, on or off, or one and zero, as you like it. What a blockchain uh, distributed ledger can do is to store much more complex uh, information, including who services an asset, what is the dividend attached? Where does the dividend come from? When is it going to be paid? Is this asset collateralized or not? Things like this. Um, that is, of course, something that allows for great efficiency increases, in particular when you think that because of the distributed, na led, uh, of the distributed nature, everybody has access to this data. And that is also what allows us to store smart contracts on a blockchain. And by the way, despite the fact that somebody said this morning, you can imagine smart contracts outside a blockchain. That is true, but to me, these are not really smart contracts. And in a moment, I will uh, explain why I think, think this. Then the third characteristic is the immutability of the record and also of the process. You have the certainty of execution. Once a transaction is initiated, you have the certainty of execution <coughs> of transfers, like in Bitcoin, or of smart contracts, like in the Ethereum context. And that also means, because somehow code is law, and we are going to come back to that, of course, it means that you have a certainty to acquire. Yeah? You have it, you see it, it's yours, and actually, from the logic, it means there is no danger for you to lose it again. It's finished, it's final. And the word final has a specific meaning, which we will see also a little bit later. But for me, the big question is, and I have, I will discuss this in a moment, will these characteristics actually survive? Yeah, the use case, financial asset, will networks on which we store real financial assets, say money, securities, derivatives, will they have the original characteristics of blockchain? I personally, I don't think so, and I will expose um, the reasons for that in a moment. But first, let's talk a little moment about smart contracts. And there's a couple of things, a couple of points I'd like to make. And this is something maybe we need to discuss at some point, Lee, <laughs> because actually I, I, am, I think exactly the opposite. Smart contracts are not about automation. For mm -hmm. me, smart contracts are not about efficiency or speed, yeah, because we have all this already. So many things are automated and to, automated to a very, very high degree. So talking about smart contract doesn't actually add anything. In my opinion, smart contracts are only about one thing. And this one thing 
is the certainty of execution. You cannot stop it. And because you cannot stop it, this increased certainty, certainty decreases the cost, for example, of borrowing, because you, will be, uh, you, you can be certain that will, you will be paid back. And um, one of my favorite authors on this subject uh, works, typically, works uh, in his article with the example of a starter interrupter for a car. So you finance your car through an auto loan, and as soon as you default on the payment of your installments through the mobile network, there is a starter interrupter in the car that will uh, interrupt the circuit in the car and you can't start it anymore. You can't use it anymore. And that increases the certainty of the lender that you will pay back your loan. That makes sense. The more certain this is, the bigger the threat is to uh, the victim of this uh, arrangement. Uh, if you can't stop it, no, with increasing certainty that this will actually be executed, the readiness to pay back the loan will increase. And that, in my opinion, can only be based on the absoluteness of the code in, 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 in an environment that is absolutely immutable, like the blockchain, because so far we don't have it. Think of a starter interrupter, let's say something goes wrong, you can still somehow call your bank and say, well, li listen, my grandmother is ill, or something like this. Yeah, there is still the, a way to modify the automated execution of something. And therefore, I don't think we are talking about real smart contracts here. Now, a lot of what Lee has explained to us is actually about what I'm also talking about now. That is that you need to make provisions for all sorts of scenarios, like grandmothers that become unwell, or a derivative contract on which you default, but it's nobody's fault, and therefore actually both parties would prefer not to terminate it, and st instead of having it immediately terminated, what normally you would program into, it, into that code. So what can you do? You can program into the code all these different scenarios up to a very high level of granularity. That means you take care of them and you give the machine a, a, an instruction that is predefined how to react in different scenarios. I call this the granularity. You had, you had, a, different, you had a different term for this. Now, the interesting thing is granularity as such doesn't change smart contracts, but what most people think about is actually that there will be some input from outside. Now, there may be instances where the smart contract needs input from outside. And the original smart contract only, concept of a smart contract only accepts that when this input comes from a source which is itself not susceptible to manipulation. Yeah, that is called an oracle. But again, this is not what we are talking about, in, in particular when we think of the use of smart contracts in finance. We think of other things, kind of data that comes from other sources that can be manipulated. If you can manipulate the data sources, you can manipulate the outcome of the smart contract. Yeah? There's even the idea that well, the regulator should have access directly or indirectly to the execution of smart contracts, for example, to prevent systemic risk. Yeah, and I, I very much agree with it. I will uh, explain this in a moment. So there is human input, organizational input. Is that really still a smart contract? I don't really know. I'm sure that with the, de with, with the degree of granularity, and with the increasing variety of input sources, um, the degree of certainty of execution also goes down naturally. And that means we are getting further and further away from the original idea of a smart contract towards an automated contract. I'm not saying that is good or bad. I'm just saying we are talking about two different things here. Now having this put straight what I, what I mean when I talk about it. I've just two more slides. I come with a couple of questions. Looking at this environment of 
blockchain on which you can uh, store smart contracts that auto-execute. I wonder, might there be problems in terms of public policy, yeah, regulation? So the first one is maybe a question of resilience. What about if these systems don't work or work in a way that we do not pro predict? And most of you will have heard of the of the famous DAO event on the Ethereum network, where actually such a combination of smart contracts did not work as it was expected to work, which ended in a, in a fully fledged disaster. So is that something we can really afford? I don't, I don't think so. If there are programming, if programming errors or something like this, or unwanted outcomes that nobody predicted, we, we would need to be able to change that. What about hurting and flash crashes, we have mentioned that earlier. I think if you really, if you really stick to the original idea of smart contracts, uh, there is a real danger that because of a combination of outcomes, which over years that these things may, may, may exist, are very difficult to predict in different combinations, and then you put this still in a market environment, yeah, and there is certain data input, and let's imagine this data input, um, gives an input that is not foreseeable, you, you, you don't really, you can't predict what happens and you can't stop it. So I don't think, that, I think there might be a problem. Next thing, the regulatory moratoria or stay or the emergency stop when something goes wrong, like, like a flash crash, and flash crashes do happen, we know that. And what do we do when a flash crash happens? We just stop the market for a moment until we have found out where the problem is, if there was actually a material problem. Very often there isn't. It's just computers freaking out. <coughs> and I think we do need to have something like that, but that is human input. So again, we get away, if we, if we accept that, we get away from the concept of smart contract. Again, I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying there's something different. Then what about shadow banking? We have these blockchain, blockchain networks where we can store value how much value actually can we store in a blockchain network? We do store blo value in Bitcoin. Is there maybe some systemic effects to that when huge amounts of assets are stored on such a network? Do we want to supervise that maybe? Then I see an issue with internal governance and access. And access in, in Europe has been, has been uh, an issue for many, many years. Imagine a consortium of banks actually sets up successfully a blockchain network, and it works. Is there maybe a public interest to make sure that the moment this network is moving towards becoming something like an infrastructure, like the infrastructures we are having at the moment, because basically all big banks somehow participate. What about the others, the, those that join later or those that are smaller? At the moment, we guarantee a certain, certain access. Uh, at the moment, there is a regulation on this point. I think we would need that in relation to blockchain networks too. Uh, and then, obviously, we have the question of anonymity and delocalization, because we shouldn't forget that in the original blockchain, um, that is the scenario. Yeah, you have the distributed ledger around the world and you have some private people organizing the whole thing under nobody's control. And they could be literally everywhere. And if we introduce in country X a regulation, they, would quick, they could te theoretically just move to country Y and the thing is over. So I think um, we need regulation here. One last point, two last points. I think there's also something we need to consider from the point of view of commercial law. So not regulation, the do's and don'ts of the market, but the question of whether rights we acquire are actually enforceable or not. I think when assets are, inquire, assets are acquired on a blockchain network, we need to think about the impact that has on the people outside of the blockchain network because there will always be people outside. We as human beings, at least, we cannot be on the blockchain. That's not, that's not possible. So do we really want something that is totally disconnected because we say the code of the blockchain is law, 
that is disconnected from our law, from our normal law. I'm not so sure. And that materializes in the, in the event of insolvency. What about the general creditors of somebody who has stored everything on the blockchain and the rules of the blockchain tell us to whom these assets now belong? Can we still make sure that the assets are shared following the rules we deem appropriate? And by the way, the whole thing has also effects on risk management and bank capital because risk management and bank capital is closely intertwined with legal rules. And I know in this room there's a couple of specialists on collateralization and netting that very heavily depends on enforceability in legal terms. So that is something that needs to be aligned because otherwise if that cannot may be, sure, may, uh, 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 be assured 100%, how do we calculate capital requirements and how do we manage our risk? So I think there are at the moment more questions than answers. My bottom line is I think it needs to be regulated one way or the other, and it will be regulated, and most market participants will have an interest in being, it being regulated. And I think we need to consider very, very carefully how we integrate the code law with the real law. Thank you very much. Thank you.